All right. Five, four, three, two, one. Welcome to the Hot Drinks Podcast. I am thrilled to have Phil Henderson here, longtime Knowles instructor, longtime Knowles program supervisor, program everything, repair maintenance, branch manager, twig manager, maybe not branch manager yet. Have you run a bench? Nope. Pretty much. And just about everything else with Knowles and, and many other jobs he's had over his outdoor, illustrious outdoor career in, in outdoor education. And I'm thrilled. Phil, we've never met in person. I've heard your name probably for 20 years since I started with the school in about 99. And uh, I'm thrilled to chat with you today. So many people over the last uh, six months have said I have to speak with you and, and it's great to have on. Thanks for taking some time to chat with me today. Yeah, no problem. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Yeah, I'm looking forward forward to getting into it and, and hearing some of your, your stories. And then we're going to finish up. you got some exciting stuff going on right now and in the near future. So we'll touch on that before we wrap up for the evening. Let's start off like we do on all our podcasts. What is your favorite hot drink in the field? Ooh, my favorite hot drink is Super Cocoa. Super Cocoa. All right. You got to describe yeah. Super Cocoa. Super Cocoa. So we've got hot chocolate and everything else you can put in it. Um, <laughs> butter. Hot sauce. Uh, hot sauce? Yeah, hot sauce. Right. You ever put hot sauce in hot cocoa? I think and, I've and... had some like chili cocoa at some fancy uh, uh, some fancy coffee shop, but never in the field. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Hot sauce. Um, peanut butter. Uh, sugar. Milk. You put extra sugar in more than the cocoa provides. Yeah, you can put a little sugar in there as well. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And is this all in the one or is this different, different mixtures? No, no, no. All in one. Wow. In one. Wow. Yeah. That's intense. And so now is that, is that like uh this has been a really rough day. I need to this, or is this like a nightly or morning every day? No, but no, it's more, more winter, more winter yeah. trips, you know? So it yeah. does two things. It keeps you really warm, but it keeps you regular as well. So yeah. <laughs> right on. Sounds like you almost need to eat that one with a fork. Right. <laughs> yeah. No doubt. Mm -hmm. Super cocoa. Wow. Yeah. I've tried a few of those in there, but I've, I've never put them all together. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. yeah. No, it's awesome. So my, one of my favorite, uh, one of my favorite pastimes for winter, winter courses was, you know, I would make, um, I would make bread pudding before mm. going in the field. I'd make a bread pudding and then just wrap it up and take it in the field. So right. in the evening, you could take a piece of bread pudding, put it in the fry pan with some butter, heat it up and oh. some cocoa and you're, it's on. Wow. That sounds amazing. That was for river courses, I guess you're taking the bread pudding. What's that? I guess that's for river courses or no, the winter. No, 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 winter courses. Yeah, winter, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. You just carry them in the field. Yeah. Right. Why not? Throw you're them in the sled. Enough stuff anyway. <laughs> right. Yeah. I remember hearing stories of people like taking turkeys in there for Thanksgiving and putting them in the bonfire. And <laughs> just like oh, yeah. oh, some yeah. crazy stuff on those winter courses where you, you've got a sled and a bit of extra space. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. Right on. Well, let's. Let's start back at the early part of your outdoor education career with Knowles. And, and I'm interested, I don't ask this to every, every guest, but um, seeing you are an African-American and, you know, there's not many of them in Knowles and around outdoor education, not many African-American folks, and there's more and more every day. And, and we obviously need lots and lots more, but I'm really personally interested on kind of your, you know, maybe kind of give you the, the synopsis of kind of your journey to get to Knowles and the work in outdoor education. Like, as we mentioned before, before you started recording, you know, you obviously didn't have many folks like yourself kind of growing up and in the early years of Knowles. Um, what was your journey? So um, I actually stumbled upon Knowles. Um, I, uh, you know, as, as a lot of people like myself, I, I was a traditional sports person. I played baseball and football mm -hmm. from, seven, eight years old until, until I was in college. And where'd in, you grow up? Uh, in San Diego. Okay. Yeah. And, uh, I actually, um, I, I had a, uh, an injury. And when I was in college, I actually fractured a vertebrae in my neck. Oh. And, um, a lot of people playing sports. Was, yeah. Playing football. Yeah. Okay. And I was, I actually was paralyzed, uh, no from the way. neck down for a few minutes. And then I spent the next so oh, probably 14, almost 16 months on disability. Wow. It was in and, the middle of college. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, um, and during that time, I just realized that life was short and you should do whatever it is you want to do in life because it could stop at any moment, you know? And right. so a lot of people don't go through things like that at, at, at a young age, you know? So I had a lot of time to sit, contemplate and so on. And, um, 
just prior to that, a friend, a friend of mine that I played football with, we, there was a lake that we wanted to go to to go fishing. And so we went to that. We, it was 11 miles away. So we had to, we had to go hiking. We had to hmm. go camping. And that was the first time I had ever gone camping. I was 21 really? years old. Yeah. No way. So your parents didn't worth- take you as kids or anything? No, yeah. I never, I didn't grow up camping. Or I think yeah. I, you know, we had six, you, did, you, did y'all have sixth grade camp when you were growing up? Yeah, we had something like that. I grew up in Canada, so it's a little different, but yeah, they definitely yeah. have different outdoor education programs for fellow yeah. school. So we, we had sixth grade camp, you know, yeah. I, I, I kind of, I vaguely remembered sixth grade camp, but outside of that, yeah. I never went camping or anything. So, sure. um, so anyway, we went to the store, we bought all our stuff. We went, went to go camping, you know, hiked to this lake, 11 miles had some great fishing, came back. I had this injury. I had so much of a great time at that place and fishing. I was like, you know, almost two years later, I was like, I'm going to go back Mm. because I could, right? At that point, I couldn't, the doctor told me no more contact sports, anything Mm. that could, that could risk me fracturing my neck again, I shouldn't do. Right. And, um, I had a good time at that, at that place. And so I started going back there and then realized that they had a volunteer ranger program where you could do these interpretive hikes with people right Mm -hmm. so you would you know you would tell them what the wildflowers were and show them where springs were so they could get water and talk about the the cultural history of the native americans that lived in that area and so on and in exchange for that when the maintenance guy went out into the park to do whatever he needed to do you could ride with him and he'd just drop you off wherever anywhere on his route and then you just have to hike back so I just only had to hike half the distance instead of right. having to hike out and back. Oh yeah. And uh, and so that was my introduction to like state parks and those mm. kind of things. And I was pretty intrigued and I was like, wow, this is kind of cool. Like he he does this for a job. He lives here in this place and so on. And I was in the North Face store buying some boots. Hmm. And I asked the guy in the North Face store, like, where do you learn like that kind of stuff? You know this outdoor stuff and he gave me two telephone numbers because back in the day there was right. internet existed but it was in 90 something you know? right or actually yeah. it wasn't even in the 90s yet wow that was still in the 80s probably 80s 88 89 somewhere in there All right yeah pre-internet and um he gave me two telephone numbers one to Knowles, and one to outward bound no way and i called and ordered the catalogs he had you yeah i remember the catalogs for sure yeah and then and the Knowles catalog came in the mail first. And that was it. Wow. I looked at that, I looked at the magazine and I was like, wow, you could do this stuff. Yeah. And I'm like, I'm gonna do it. And I think it would maybe just two, maybe three years after that. I saved my work, saved my money and so on. Yeah. And I quit my job and went to the Knowles schools. No way. And what course did you take? I'd semester in the Rockies. Wow. That must have been, so you probably hadn't done too much hiking since then or camping or were, were you slowly building up knowing that you were um, going to be doing this? No, I had, I had camped, you know, cause I enjoy going to this, to, to, to that state park, you know, so yeah. I had camped a couple of times. Right. Um, I had a, a, a friend of mine um, that, you know, I introduced him to it. So we'd go out and, and go hiking and, yeah. and stuff. And then we ended up you know, going up to the redwoods and just going to different mm. places and so on. And so, yeah. I, you know, and I had skied, a friend of mine that I worked with took me skiing once and, He's like, okay, this is how you stop. And we went to the top of the hill and that was that. You know? <laughs> but it was, you know, it was fun. Right? Yeah, yeah. So I had been skiing a couple of times and whatever. So I had, I'd been doing a few things, but in terms of being, uh, you know, aware of all, you know, the fact that you could go, you know, climbing, I didn't know what really what rock climbing was during right. that time. And, um, and, you know, backcountry skiing and, yeah. you know, never been on a river before you know or in a kayak things like that so it was for the most of it was pretty damn new to me for sure yeah what did your parents think when you were heading off you say i'm gonna i got the semester program i'm gonna do well i was 27 years old when i took that really 27 wow yeah i was 27 so my parents you know they they weren't really in the picture in that sense right right yeah yeah that's the difference i was i was i was already an adult and yeah you know i had been working at a job for nine years you oh wow! What type of work that. were you doing? Like, were you on? As where, I worked at Costco. I worked at Costco. No way. Which was Price Club at the time. They switched yep. to Costco, but it was yep. Price Club during those days. So. All right. So, did you picture yourself there, kind of longer term, before you ended up, you know, with a massive career change? 
Um, it, I, I actually did, but then when I when I um when I learned about this program, when I saw that, and when I had that injury, literally after that injury, I realized it's like I do not want to walk into this warehouse every day for right the next 25, 30 years. I yeah. don't want to do it. So how did that semester go? It was great. You know, yeah. um, I mean, I learned a lot, you know what I mean? And I didn't, it, it's very much unlike today. I didn't go in it thinking, oh, I'm going to be the only black person there. There's just mm. there's no representation. That, that was, that stuff didn't even exist at right. that time. You know, um, I was more mature in a sense as well. I was older in age. I had worked in different places with different sure. people. I get along with anyone. That's one of the things that I brought that, mm. that, um, that a lot of young younger folks don't have you know but as well it was a spring semester in the rockies in 1992 okay so you think about what was happening in our country in the spring of 1992 you and i can't remember i'm I'm in canada but i i follow the u.s news i was in i was in grade 11 at that point while i was on a semester yeah while i was on that semester we were in red rocks um, for a climbing section and the Rodney King riots were happening. Oh, uh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. And, wow. uh, and I had a choice. I had a choice because my mother lived in, in my mom lived in Inglewood. Um, she was right in wow. the thick of it. Yeah. And I had a choice to either leave and go be with my mom and make sure she was okay or stay or stay on that course. And there was not, not nothing really I could do. And it's been so long now that I, I don't even remember even if I called, yeah. you know, because yeah. it wasn't, you know, that we didn't have cell phones. Right. And you, you probably know, didn't realize phones. how much it was blowing up if you're off on a semester course and not right. getting much You use. didn't know because we didn't have social media and sure. internet and all those things, you know, so yeah. you really didn't know. Um, but I know that we didn't really talk about it, yeah. you know, so it just, it, it kind of went, but definitely I was, but I, I was aware of it. And when we got back, I, I, I knew what was going on in town. So, yeah. yeah. Wow. But to have lived through that during yeah. that time, you know, and being out on those course during that time is pretty significant for me. Yeah. So I assume after you did that course, you were kind of smitten with Knowles and, and everything after education and, and decided that I need nope. to I need to get back here and work, or was it a different path to to start in your instructor course? No, it was so so a couple of my instructors, um, like man, you, you know, you should you should think about. It becoming an instructor. Michael Cheek was still a really good friend mm. to this day, you know. Um, Gary Wilmot, Michael Cheek. Yeah, great um, guys. Lynn, Lynn, Lynn uh, not, no, not Lynn Petzl. Yeah, um, Lynn Wolf. Um, not Lynn Wolf, uh, not Lynn, I forget. It'll come to it you. Was a few, yeah, it'll come to me, but a, a few of those folks. Yeah, you know? yeah. And so I was like, okay, I kind of thought about it, but I was just going to go right back to my job, you know, and because I didn't know that you could do that stuff for work. You right. know? I didn't go to Knowles planning that, you know, sure. like I'll go have this uh-huh. experience and go home. Yeah. And, uh, but afterwards I was like, oh, okay, I'll just go back to work and make a long story short. I didn't go back to work at Price Club. Mm-hmm. Okay? I ended up going to work at REI. Oh yeah. Well, that's okay. a good shift. Yeah. It's a pretty good shift. The wheels are in motion now. Yeah, the little wheels were in motion. That and that's really when I started really noticing more that that black people in the outdoors didn't didn't mm. click for some people, right? Right. So, um, but while I was working there, uh, a guy, I just happened to be. Everything is opportunities, right? You just be in the right place at the right time, whatever. So I just happened to be standing at the cash register for some reason. And this guy walks up and says, hey, do you mind if I display my brochure for my whitewater rafting company here? And uh, and I looked at one of them. He was still standing there. And I was like, do you need any guides? What made me say that? I, I really don't know. And he says, well, do you have any experience? And I was like, maybe two months off of a nose core or something oh, like wow. that. Yeah. Which had and a river I said, section. Yeah. I had a river section. I'm like, yeah, I was on the green river, you know, the gates of the door, blah, blah, blah. He's like, here's my number. Give me a call. Wow. Okay. And um, I called him. He said, okay, why don't you come out? You ride down the river with us. I won't charge you. Just pay for lunch and we'll see. Right. So I went down the river and the guy 
that was guiding the boat, he let me guide like the last two or three rapids. So he says, okay, this is what I'll do. I'll give you a boat. You have your crew and you all will pay for lunch. That's it. And you get three clean runs down the river and I'll give you work. No way. I said, okay, cool. You know, well, getting my friends to go down the river was like pulling teeth. <laughs> did, that's not something we did. You know right. What I mean? And so I, but I, I, my girlfriend at the time was a teacher so the first trip i got her and some of her friends teacher friends to go down the river with me. Ah. got a clean run there was someone uh, that came in the store who was visiting her sister and was asking me about things to do around i'm like you want to go rafting <laughs> she's like cool you know got a couple other folks and we went rafting and about two weeks later this guy calls me he's like hey can you work this coming weekend and I said, no, I mean, I, I'm like, I can, but I only got two runs. You said, I need to get three. He's like, nah, don't worry. The guy said, you'll be fine. <laughs> and How were you on it. those runs? Were you pretty nervous or were you like, this is pretty smooth? I got this. No, I mean, I mean, yeah, you're in whitewater. You're always nervous. Sure. You know okay. what I mean? So, yeah. yeah. But um, yeah. And so I, I was like, okay, cool. I'll, I'll go. And that's how I got my first job right guiding white water and what river was that by chance and that was on the stanislaus river hmm. in california okay. which is pretty significant because it was the first year if i'm not mistaken 92 um 90, so it was have been the summer of 92 and it was the first year that the stanislaus the camp nine run in the stanislaus river had come back after being flooded when they oh. when, the, when the dam was was built okay it completely and so there was a drought for a number of years and the water receded and the river came back nice. and it was the first year that 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 section had come back and so it was it was pretty uh historic in a sense yeah. the fact that i even just got an opportunity to guide on that section of the river right yeah. is that river being still guided now or is it i'm um, not sure but probably yeah. yeah 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 cool and uh yeah and so you you worked there for a little while and then so i worked there two i worked there two se two seasons the summer of 92 and the summer of 93 yeah. Okay. And at this, at that point, it really was like, I want to become an instructor. Okay. So what do I need to do to become an instructor? Right. Well, you got to have experience being outside and teaching people, guiding people, those kind of things. And yeah. so that's what I was doing, you know? Yeah. So what made two, you, what, what made you want to be, because obviously there's a, there's a difference. And I talk about it every now and then, you know, between guiding and instructing outdoor education and guiding clients. Yeah. And, and so you're in the guiding clients role. It's where you started off your, your outdoor career. What, yeah. what made you kind of like, I need to get back on kind of the education side of things, or I got to get back to Knowles. That was always the, that was always the, 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 the goal. Yeah. I didn't know the difference. Okay. I didn't know any difference between guiding and outdoor education Okay. at that, at that time, to be right. honest about it. I yeah. knew, but I knew that the experience, just teaching people things and being outdoors was going to help me become a Knowles instructor. Right. Yeah. So that's, that's where I put my focus. You know? Yeah. And then the same thing happened. So I did that during the summer. Right. So I would work for two years. I pretty much worked seven days a week when I could. So I worked at Mon at REI Monday through Thursday and I go guide on right. the river Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and I come back and work. Okay. Wow. And then during the shoulder season, you know, I'd go kayak and I'd even go to the ocean and go kayak just to up my, my kayaking skills. Yeah. Know? Um, go start you know climbing and those kind of things and then i'd go skiing so i wanted more winter experience mm, right so i went to lake tahoe you know they have i didn't care what i did i just wanted to just be in the winter and, and, and right. get my feet just ski for the yeah. most part right and actually i went to there was a job fair at squaw valley and this mm. is uh, i stood in that line for that job fair for two hours <laughs> just to get to the front and the guy says oh i'm sorry somebody like with, with hair like that we won't we don't we won't let people like that work here no way and to this day i never ski at squaw valley right wow i've banned, I've banned that place that's amazing yeah. right they, they didn't get away with that now so i went to it's like well what's gonna so i went to a place called homewood it's this little small ski area on the west shore and I was like, I'll just, I could just be a lift operator or something. It doesn't really matter. So I went to fill out an application. I'm standing at the desk 
And the woman's like, here's the application. And as soon as I do that, this, a gentleman walks out of another door and asks the woman, have we had any applications for a ski instructor? And she, <laughs> instructor. Just, she said, no, but maybe this guy wants to, wants to be a ski instructor. And he asked me, he's like, have you ever been a ski instructor? I said, no. He's like, do you ski? Yeah. Have you ever taught anything? You know, I'm like, well, you know, I was on this North course and I, you know, I guided Whitewater, blah, blah, blah. And he's like, you want to, you want a job? <laughs> okay, I would take a job, you know, but it's the only job I ever got fired from. Oh, really? I, I had you done much skiing up until now? I had skied a bit, you know, yeah. um, I could ski, you know, but yeah. I enjoy skiing. I don't, I didn't, I don't think I, at that time, I wasn't going to enjoy teaching people how to ski and moving up the ladder and the PSI, right. you know, levels and all that stuff. I just wanted to ski, basically. Mm -hmm. but it was a job. So it got me, you know, it got me in the snow. All right. So I would work at REI Monday through Thursday, go to Tahoe and teach and show, you know, skiing Friday, yeah. Saturday, Sunday. And there was a day where it was a powder day. It had dumped, it had dumped a fair amount of snow in Tahoe. And I'm like, man, I'm not working today. I'm going skiing. And uh, I was in the lift line and my boss shows up. And he's like, how come you not working? No way. <laughs> yeah, man. And so that afternoon, I went to go put my skis away in the, in the ski shed. And someone said to me, oh, man, I heard you got fired. I was like, really? <laughs> and uh, sure enough, I got fired from that job. No, but way. that's the only job I ever got. But I got fired for about a day, so it's it's all good. So, uh, it might might have been worth it at that point, right? Yeah, right. On. And then I applied, and so that was the that was the. Then the next year, ninety three, I taught skiing, and that was the year I got fired. But then I applied for my instructor's course in mm. uh, ninety for nine this you know summer of ninety four. Yeah, yeah. And, and that was uh, the river. That was the river instructor course. Uh, no, it was actually a mountain instructor's course. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. and. Um, and so I, I, I got uh, accepted went. to my instructor's course. And then there's some other things that are outside sure. of those that go along with that. We don't yeah. need to talk about, but yeah. yeah right on. And that's how I got my foot in the door. And then wow. I started working for those yeah. like that, that fall, yep. basically. Yeah. yeah, that's awesome. So was there in these early days, were there ever times when you're, when you were like, you know, there, there weren't people around here like me or there aren't many people of color working in this industry or at Knowles or was that even on your radar where you're just like I'm doing what I love and these are cool people oh yeah for sure it was but see at the time I was single and and I would always go home yeah so it's I, mean, I always tell people I've, I've always had a double life there's right. two different lives it's like there's the outdoor life and then there's right. you know, your, your my, buddies at home my, my family life and you know that that side of it and so when I wasn't working um I would go back home you yeah. know, but then I quickly realized that if I'm going to get to a certain level and if I want to work certain types of courses, I need to spend time doing those things. Right. Right. You got to get out and do them. And so slowly but surely those trips home became, became climbing trips. Right. Skiing yeah. trips, boating trips, you know, and that's, that's kind of when I, you know, kind of made that switch fully, and it became fully committed. I mean, it just became totally committed and aware as well. Yeah. And that hmm. it was healthy, you know, I stayed yeah. in shape. Um, you know, I played football. I mean, even the, the weight I had when I played football, I've never had again. I've right. never weighed that much because I don't, I don't, I don't do those same things. Yeah. You know? um, right. and, I, and I realized I don't need that weight, you know, I'm yeah. a lot more healthy doing, doing it this way. So, yeah, I didn't really think about it. Um, but because I always had a, I always had an outlet. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And during those outlets is really when I started realizing that it wasn't something that, that black people were doing because people mm. would say, you do what? Right. Why would you do that? You know, you, right. whatever. Right. But then every now and there'd be one person like, I'd like to try that. And so I always would, would latch onto those people and say, okay, come on, I'll, I'll take you because I needed mm experience teaching people things you know right yeah. so that's kind of how I, I i gained that experience and then you know of course teaching those courses and you know how that is like your first course you're learning and you know yeah, there's a absolutely. there's a learning curve. always learning, a learning <laughs> curve there. yeah you're always learning there's, yeah. a, there's a huge learning curve and um but what really kept me you know i have you know people like i was mentioning before you know quincy and mark who you know we would go climbing together when i was in lander and mm. 
you know, Larry Berger would, would just, he would just come belay for me. He was my belay slave you know? <laughs> and, and just let me climb, you know, yeah. which was huge. Um, you know, folks, Greg Collins and, and mm. Colby and, you know, and, um, and uh, Pete Absalon, rest in peace, Pete. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of folks would just come and say, hey, man, you come on, you want to go skiing? And I'm like, cool, you know? So I really, I, I tell people a lot. I had, I had really good mentors in my outdoor career. Mm. It's just that they were all white. Right. You know, and it's yeah. not a it, it's not a negative thing. It's just my reality. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So, yeah. Well, good for you for, you know, following your passion, you know, and not letting uh, the social norms of, of your childhood <laughs> dictate what you become. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 All right, let's, well, let's jump into your knowledge career and, and kind of outdoor education and let's hear some stories, maybe some of the early on, some of the early learnings or, or some of the epics that you, you found yourself in early on in your career. Oh, is yeah. There, is there and one or two stories that jump out? You know, my, my, the, the first story that comes to mind really is my first course. And, and uh, because I had, you know, I had, I, had, I had taken a semester and so I had climbing skills, I had white water skills and mm -hmm. I had taken the WIS as well. I could work winter courses. So my first course, um, I actually proctored a summer semester. Wow, your first course you proctored? My first course I proctored no a summer way. semester. Wow, yeah. that's intense. But I also think too that that was, that, that was, that was by default. Like mm. They just couldn't find anybody else to work that damn course. So <laughs> that was the one, you know? But it was like, cool, whatever. You know what I mean? I got to in. It's all good, you know? Yeah. Um, but that course, uh, it was like, again, it was a summer semester in the Rockies. So we had uh, a hiking section, a river section, and a climbing section. Okay. A hiking section, okay, it went, you know, it goes. The river section, back, I think the, the river program in Bernal, the, 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 the program itself and having the permits and all that had I think it just started. It, maybe it just gotten the, the, the permit for the Green River or something. I'm not sure exactly. But we didn't do the norm of nine days on Desolation Canyon and then up to Lador. We actually went to the Arkansas River in Colorado oh, wow. with two instructors. And then we worked with RMOC, okay. the Rocky Mountain Outdoor Center, to do this trip. Right. So we were there for nine or 10 days, something like that. Okay. So the summer, that was the summer of 95. And summer of 95, the Arkansas was at flood stage. Oh, it, was, wow. it was historic water level year. It was running like 20,000 or something like that. It was crazy, right? The good thing about it was in the, in the early, summer of, early summer of 94, I, I worked a program with Outward Bound. And then okay. between that and my instructor's course of 94, I, I guided on the Arkansas River. Oh, wow. So, so I knew the familiar. rivers. So yeah. I knew the river itself, you know. Anyways, we did a bunch of trips. You know, we'd be done by noon doing, you know, 15 miles of river and back in camp by noon. Wow. But on that trip, I had a student who we had to just talk to him about risk and risk management quite often. Okay. One of the things I remember this kid doing is like standing up and doing a backflip off the off the oh, raft yeah. into the water. Right? <laughs> and we talked to him about it a number of times. Sure. So we went on to the climbing section. And the climbing section was in Vitable, Wyoming. Okay. And we were there. We went through our, you know, progression, blah, blah, blah. And it was time to start multi-pitching. So we told the students, okay, we're going to start multi-pitching. What do you guys want to do tomorrow? Do you want to climb? Do you want to take a, a take a rest day? And they all decided they want to take a rest day. So as instructors, we went out and climbed. <laughs> so we got back to camp. Um, and actually, if I'm not mistaken, it was Gary Wilmot was actually there on a personal trip climbing with some friends. Okay. And he happened to see one of our students, free solo a route oh no and he was like 70 feet off the deck and he came and he told us about it you know and again i'm the proctor and this is you know we have maybe a week left in the semester oh wow right? and this, this is, is the group. same student <laughs> this is the same student we talked to uh, about doing backflips and so on off the raft right right okay 
So I asked the students, I go to them, ah, what did you guys do today? Oh, nothing, blah, blah, blah. You know, went out and watched some people climb, blah, blah. But nobody fessed up to this guy free soloing. So I mentioned it. Oh, yeah, this guy was an old instructor, just happened to see you this. And they said, oh, busted. Okay. <laughs> so, you know, there's, there are consequences, right? There are consequences to your actions and at that point it's like man we've talked to you a number of times about risk management and this it's like yeah it's within your ability but what happened if you fail yeah. right and we talked about these things and then we made a decision it's like man and of course i'm the proctor they left it up to me so i'm like nah get out of here man you know oh yeah you'd had so enough we go and had enough you know we go to tell the students and of course they're bitching about you know Oh, you should give him a second chance and blah, blah, blah. And like, look, we this is not only his second chance, this is his third chance or whatever. But here's the deal. You all would not be saying that same thing right now if had he fallen. Yeah. You would be saying how stupid he was if he had fell and splattered his brains all over the ground. Right? That's what I told them. So we decided we would take the student back to back to back to Lander. Okay. So I take the student back to Lander. And while I'm in Lander, I find out that Jerry Garcia died. Oh, yeah. No joke. Yeah. So on the ride back, I'm just I'm, I'm contemplating myself. Do I tell the students that Jerry Garcia died or do I not? Because half of them are going to be useless. They will not be able to function if they know that. Wow. And so I decided not to tell them. Right. You know, I didn't even know who Jerry Garcia was. It wasn't that wasn't in my community. That wasn't in my in my right. circle. Right. Yeah. Yeah. But half of my students were deadheads. Right. Back in nine, you know, ninety five. Yeah. So, we ended up telling them in the ride on the van at the end of the course, going back to Lambda. Wow. And uh, it was heartbreaking for a lot yeah. of them. It was yeah. really heartbreaking for a lot of them. Right. Um, so now I'm going to fast forward yeah. to that same student. Okay. Same student. Same the one, student. The one you, ex- you just expelled. Yeah. That was expelled. And I'm going to fast forward like maybe 10 years. Okay. A friend of mine was in a, in a, in a ski rental place, renting some skis to go ski in and was talking to this guy at the desk. And he happened to mention his nose course. And she says, oh, yeah, well, who were your instructors? I have some friends who work at, at, at Knowles. It's like, oh, this guy, Phil. She's like, Phil was your instructor? She's like, yeah. He, and, she, and he told her. He's like, he actually kicked me, he kicked me off that course. I got expelled from that course. But it was the best thing that ever happened to me. That's no what he said. Yeah. So you don't often get feedback about your students somewhere down yeah. the line. It's like you spend a month with them, they go away. Yeah. Right? Yeah. But in this instance, I got that in that the decision I made yeah. to remove that student from that course was a good decision. It was the right decision. And he learned from it. So, wow. Yeah. It's amazing. So that's my my yeah. first story. Yeah, yeah. That's your first course. You had to expel a student on your first course. That's, that's never an easy thing to do. And uh, always a challenge thing to go through. Yeah. Um, yeah. And when you mentioned kind of Jerry Garcia, it's like, I think every Knowles instructor that's been working for a while or anybody in outdoor education that does long expeditions have those moments of like when you found out significant news off a trip that that's happened in the world. And, and yeah. you kind of remember those times and places. And it's, it's different from a lot of people because they're, you know, in their, in their home when they find out news or wherever, but um, you know, there's a few times that stick out for me. Like I remember when we finished our instructor's course, we had no idea, but Columbine had happened. Um, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and it's like, you know, I, I picture it, you know, right now it was like, it was tomorrow or yesterday. And, uh, you know, the, um, I think, I guess the drivers came out in the vans and, and told us, and, um, there's been a few other times like that, that things come up, but it's, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of shell shocked. And then for a lot of, a lot of times I didn't, I, I was always, even to this day, I have a, a kind of a, I, I don't know what you call it, but once I'm out on a trip, I, I kind of get anxiety coming back. Yeah, you're wondering. Um, because of that reason. So I've had uh, two, of, both of my grandmothers passed away while I was in the field. Oh, no. Um, 
So I've had a number of things happen, yeah, you know. Yeah. That makes so you that know, you're I, always wondering. I'm always wondering. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Always wondering. Yeah. Yeah. I got to the point after September 11th, I started carrying a shortwave radio, mm-hmm. um, just a small one that I would, you know, the students wouldn't know I had it, but it was a kind of a, a three or four year period there where I was doing a ton of field work. And I was like, I, you know, I don't know if the world's going to stop turning when I come out of the field. Like, I kind of want to know. Right. This is this is my life here. This is not like it's not like my one time in my life I can go a month without being in touch. And right. um, so I, I would I would check it in every now and then. But yeah, no, it's a, it's an interesting uh, kind of life that we live when we're we're working in the field a lot. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So kind of mid course. Uh, you, did you end up working mostly river courses, or did you work kind of a mix throughout most of your time at Knowles? No, I'm, I worked a mixed. Okay. Um, you know, hiking, river, um, winter for the most part. Yeah. Okay. And that was um, and that you know, and then I went to Kenya in, in in 2000, and you know, those courses you kind of you know you, I think I proctored three semesters in oh, Kenya wow. in one year. No. I, was, I worked a ton. Wow. While I was there, but the work, the work there is not very taxing on the body. Right? Yeah. It's a different kind of trips, isn't it? It's a different kind of trip. Yeah. 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 What was your experience like going in Kenya? Obviously you got to work with a lot more black people and, and, you know, Africans himself and yeah, um, yeah. just a completely different environment. Did, did a lot of the locals think you were from Kenya or did you have any of those experiences? <laughs> so you, you, so you, have, you have to, I'll put this into perspective for you in that, um, I wasn't the first black instructor that worked. I was the first black American instructor that worked. Right. Okay. okay. And um, oh, is that me? I think that's uh, yeah. You got a phone going there? Or? Yeah, something. <laughs> anyway, um, in uh, in um, so when I went there in in what was the year that that was two thousand. Knowles had been operating in Kenya for 25 years. Yeah. They'd never had a black instructor from America go to Kenya. Right. Okay. So when I was on the coast, they had to introduce me as an instructor and they didn't understand it. Right. So they was like, yeah, this is Phil. He's from America. This is his first time to Africa. And they're like, wait, you mean so he was born in kenya and went to the u.s <laughs> forgot how to speak swahili now that he's back I'm like no 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 he was born there wow and he's here for the first time that must and have been they crazy like, for oh, you oh. they're like oh polisana <laughs> lakini karibu yumbani so what they were saying was we're really sorry but welcome home wow right wow and so from that point on, it was like they 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 treated me a little differently, you know. Yeah. And they're like, no, you have to learn how to speak Swahili. So right. they never spoke. Some You're one of us didn't speak English, but they're like, no, you you have to learn how to speak Swahili. And so that was a big drive for me to to mm. to to learn to speak Swahili. Um, when we were in in Maasai land, you know, you mm-hmm. spent a lot of time with the Maasai. Yep. And there was a woman who asked about me you know of course because also i have you know my dread my with my hair it was very much like the moranis that the young the, that are right. kind of going through adolescence and so yeah on. but they had to explain to her no no no, he's not he's not kenyan he's from america and she asked him if he's american how come he's darker than i am <laughs> and so i had to explain to her slavery and she's like oh yeah yeah i heard about you people i just never seen one before Wow. And so she asked me, well, what tribe are you from? Hmm. I said, I don't know. She's like, what do you mean? You don't know. Everybody knows what tribe they're from, right? So it makes you think, okay, these are the things that have been, that have been stripped away from us as people that you, you don't get back really, you know? Right. So she right. said, okay, well, then what's your mother tongue? What language do you speak? And I said, I don't know. Hmm. So it's wow. yet another drive to learn how to speak Swahili. Yeah. Right? So my experiences there were were different than most people, right? Yeah. Um, but it also was kind of a. It wasn't. I didn't have to prove myself when I was there. Not from day one. Mm. When I, at Knowles here, I had to prove myself. Interesting. You know. Yeah. Um, even just being an instructor. I mean, there were times where people were like, oh. 
you know, actually, um, students are only allowed on the second floor. This third floor is only for instructors. I'm like, okay, right. please. I'll make sure I let students know that when I when I see them. Right. Yeah. Wow. So the instructors um, and staff that, didn't realize you were an instructor at Nelson. Yeah. Wow. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So there was mm-hmm. some hard, you know, there was some hard hardships in that sense, but um, nothing that I wasn't that I couldn't deal yeah. with. You know what I mean? It's like, yeah. I think it was the more yeah, but that was, you know, Kenya was, um, was, was fun, yeah. you know, and some of the courses we worked there and, and working with the, the NOAA program, so working with local Kenyans and mm-hmm. whether that be school kids or rangers and, you know, porters and, and guides and whatever it was, yeah. um, those were just fun times, yeah. Wow, have and you ever had I a chance my, to go back? Oh, yeah, I've been back three times now. Oh, wow. Well, see, my wife is from Kenya, right, oh, so right, I met right. my you wife, I met my wife there as well, yeah. Uh, and, at, that, uh, at that time? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. Amazing. Yeah. yeah. That's great. Wow. All right. So that was kind of mid career in Kenya. And then um, at what stage you ended up, you know, moving a bit more into administrative roles with Knowles. Yeah. Um, what were kind of some of your, your latter field courses or, and was there a moment when you were like, I, I need a break, I need to get out of the field or, or was it just like a, a natural progression? Well, it was a natural, the natural progression was being married. Right. Right. I had come back from Kenya. We were married. I worked a, maybe a year in the field, if that. And uh, I mean, be honest, I'm like, I've seen too many, too many relationships go south with people trying to work full time in the field. Yeah. You know, and it wasn't working, you know, working in the field and being a climber and all those that I didn't, that wasn't, you know, like, I get married. I want to be with the person I married. Sure, absolutely. You know, I want to be away that much. Yeah. And so um, it was actually my wife that convinced me to, to apply for this job in Vernal. No way. You know, because it was, I mean, you know, to me, it's a job, right? You, you need a job. You need health insurance. You know, stability in life. Not, yep. you know, this unstable, right. like, nomad, nomadic <laughs> type life is not sure. what we do. You know, yeah. it wasn't, that's very foreign. I yeah. had done it for a long time as a, as a, you know, kind of grew me out of necessity right? yeah. because you had to go climbing and boating and those kind of things. Right. But when I was married, it was like, oh yeah. So I applied for that job in, in Vernal and um, I, and I, I, again, it was by default, right. Mm. That I got that job. Nobody oh, else yeah. wanted it, <laughs> ah. <laughs> you know? Yeah, and so that and, was the uh, kind of the program director or the manager of, that the, the, of the, that base? Was the, the the base manager, mm-hmm. right? Yeah, so I started working there in 2000 and 2001, and uh, and worked there until 2013. Wow, yeah, that's incredible. Which was, which was when they when they when they bought that property, Pip and Sparky were there. They were there for years. When Pip and Sparky left, Mark and and uh, uh, Dave and Jala took over. They were there for four years. Hmm. And then I took over and I was there 12 years. Wow. Yeah. That's amazing. Did you and, still work in the field while you were running the branch there? I, I, the, I, the I, I planned to, but I, I worked a, a little bit in the field, uh, yeah. mostly because it was a river program. Right. We did, um, we had like uh, board sure. director trips on the door. Right. You know, I would work a few of those courses, but it wasn't too long that I realized that if I worked in the field for one, because our operating season was so long, it was yeah. basically from March to November. Right. Yeah. And so the only time I really had to work in the field was in the winter. Right. And um, and I, I quickly realized that I couldn't work for Knowles for you know nine months out of the year and then go in the field and work for a month and then come, you know, right. Like, like no, I need time away from, yeah. from that. And so that kind of the the switch to not working field work was um was kind of you know, it's just kind of normal in a sense that it, it right. just kind of, kind of went that way, you know? Yeah. yeah. Were there any um, kind of on, on, when you were, you know, in the field or, or even in supervising, you know, any massive kind of near miss or big rescues that, that come to mind that, that might've been a bit more unique from, from your experiences? Oh yeah. Yeah. There's uh we, well, I was, um, there's, there's a couple, but uh, the main one was while I was, uh, managing the river program we had a student that got attacked by by a black bear yeah i think i might remember this yeah tell tell yeah. us that story um and the the year i forget what year it was 
I, I don't remember. Yeah, but, it was probably the early two thousands. Yeah, somewhere in there. Yeah. yeah, mid 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 two thousand something somewhere yeah. in there. I don't know, but um, but this student, he wanted to grow dreadlock. Yeah, right. And somebody, I do remember this. Somebody told him that if he put salt water in his hair, so he walked around with a salt water uh, spray bottle. Okay. And he would spray salt water in his hair all the time. And I don't know if that was the <laughs> if that was the reason. But basically, the students were, you know, camped on the beach, not sleeping in tents or whatever. And this bear came and camped and pulled him out of a sleeping bag by his head. No way. Yeah. And, uh, and yeah. And so there was, that was an evac. Um, so he had some. Was, so he had some claw marks on his head, or was his head cut open? What, what were oh, the injuries? Oh yeah, he had big lacerations in his scalp. He had puncture wounds in his neck and his shoulder. Wow! Um, it and so he bad, he woke up and bad. the bear got the bear ran away. I assume once. Yeah, yeah. Everybody woke up and the bear had him by his yeah. head and then it ran away. Yeah. Wow! And so how did that evac manage? What what river was this on? That was on that was on Desolation Canyon on the Green. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And so. And what's the know, call they, that you get? The call that I got was yeah. <laughs> there's been a well, and the funny where the call was, it, the call didn't come directly to me. Okay, so this is things. Okay. This was a this was a changing point in in the Norse program, right? Okay, um, in the river program, and I, I guess in Norse in general, but definitely in the river program because we only had we only had ground to air radios at the time, right? VHF radios, and so they couldn't get a call out to get any help. All right, because so you need a plane to, overhead to be able to actually exactly. do that. And to time mm -hmm. that is pretty challenging. Yeah, and then you're in that river corridor. Right? right. And so they basically decided that they were going to put him on a backboard, you know, immobilize him in a sense, um, put him on the backboard and go downstream, right? And uh, they happened to uh, to run upon an outward bound course. Right. <laughs> that, that had a sat phone. And so right. they called, they used the sat phone and I, for, I, I forget who they called. I think they just did a 911 call, if I'm not mistaken, and called the sheriff. Huh. Yeah, because he wouldn't have like phone numbers for the EVAC coordinator because he wouldn't be phoning them. Right, right. exactly. <laughs> you know? And so, um, so that was really my, my first kind of interaction with yeah. media, in a sense. You know? Oh, yeah. Um, which I, I'm, I'm dealing with that right now as we go sure. through this. <laughs> and so, uh, yeah, that was a major, that was a major, um, a major injury, major incident, you know? And so he ended up, you know, going to the hospital and getting stitches and had to get rabies shots. And, uh, but two weeks later we had sat phones in the program. Right. I remember that. Yeah. I was definitely working then. I was like all of a yeah. sudden the next board of directors meeting and, and the next yeah. week, like every course in the world for Knowles had a satellite phone. So right. yeah. We can't, we can't put that in the news that Knowles had to use outward bounds. satellite yeah. phone. <laughs> you know? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh man. That must've So been it's interesting to have lived through, you know, to live through that or have worked through that transition of, yeah. of communication. Right? Yeah, and now we've gone through another set of communication realms where now we have cell phones. Right. You know? Yeah. So it's, yeah, it, it, that's that's changed a, a lot. Over yeah, the yeah. I'm sure instructors are starting now. Like, can't believe that we used to even travel without communication, <laughs> let alone hand to ground air radios. Like, you what? You went up why without a cell phone. Yeah. Um, but now it's such commonplace. But that's how it changes. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah. Well, I don't want to take up too much of your time, but I, I do want to. Um, before we get to our rapid fire questions, touch on a little bit of what, what you're doing now and, um, and, you know, a big event that you hopefully have coming up this, uh, this coming spring. So right now you said you're, you're working with Osprey packs, doing a lot of repair in that, but you also have kind of a side project within Osprey that you're really passionate about. Tell us a little bit about that. We, um, the repair to share program. Yeah. yeah. And it really is. I mean, it was, it, it, I'm, I've kind of been this way a lot of my life, um, but I've learned through through work running the, the river program, you know, you, you kind of had to be resourceful in a sense, and mm -hmm. we made a lot of our own things. So I used a sewing machine and I grew up, my mother taught me how to use a sewing machine. And so, oh, so, really? So you've always yeah, been handy. Like that. I've always been handy in that sense. Yeah. Um, and then in, in, you know, working in Patagonia is the same thing. It's like you couldn't, if you didn't have it, you couldn't get it. 
Right. Um, and so we did, I did a lot of, you know, um, taking this tent apart and taking the pieces from that to make this tent go a little bit further and, and things like that and coming up with these programs to make our, our gear go a little bit further. Right. So I've always kind of been resourceful in that sense. Um, but when I came to Osprey and, and you know, it's no, it, it's just the nature of the beast and it's like nothing lasts forever, you know, and um, but also people tend to you know if you sometimes you have a little problem with something and you know they'll send it back and maybe you can fix it but they don't you know the the, the repairs that we do at osprey it's like you can't tell that it's been repaired right? right but some things are a little bit you know gone too far or it's going to take too long and so you kind of have to weigh those checks and balances and so we um we we actually dispose of a fair amount of packs and through my travels you know working with Knowles and so on you know, I realized that there are people, not only just here in this country, but people around the world that would be able to utilize those packs. And it's, it started more so to just keep them out of landfill. All right. And so, uh, so that's what I did. I started repairing those packs, doing functional repairs to them and donating them to, whether that be back to school programs, which mm. the first one I did was back home in San Diego. Nice. Um, uh, my god brother who runs a back to school drive there. So we hooked up and, and did that. And I just kind of started from there. And so it was enough that I said, you know what, I want to do this full time. And I wrote a proposal for it and, um, and made that my full time job. So. Wow. And so it's all run within Osprey. Yeah. 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 And do you, is it all Osprey packs that you're repairing or are people sending in packs? Yeah. Right, on. right. And that's, but that's my goal really is, and it doesn't, to me, it doesn't really matter, but the goal is to just make people aware of that and hopefully other people can do the same things, you know, yeah. other companies can do the same things. And I'm sure there are people out there who have those connections, sure. you know, and uh, yeah, I actually used, uh, what was it? Well, just before the pandemic, 2019, I actually used my relationship of working in Patagonia and my relationship with Katie um, and knowing that process of buying gear and getting it to Patagonia mm. that I actually sent 200 packs to Katie. She put them in the container to go actually get shipped to, to Chile no way. to donate to yeah. the, to the element, to the, um, you know, elementary school that my daughter went to No way. and just in the community. Well, and then the pandemic came and I didn't get a chance to go. And so right, right. Yeah. I wanted to see that happening. Man. I wanted to see that happen. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Wow. And well, so, hopefully there'll be a, a phase two of that and, and another, Big container ship of Knowles gear with a bunch of reused packs to, to yeah, hopefully there. they'll open, yeah. reopen that branch and get students back down there. But yeah. for now, I'm just focusing on, um, on local, you know, yeah. uh, just, just this year, you know, after the pandemic year of 2020, um, I think I've donated about 300 packs to, no uh, way. to the, you know, the local schools and, and such. And then my first year in, um, 2019 in, in half the year, it was, it was almost 800. No way. Wow. That's amazing. That That's such an incredible program and, and such a worthwhile program. And hopefully, yeah, it'll be a shining example for the industry and, and other organizations will, will jump on board with, with similar programs. Yeah. yeah. Well, and then let's go again, before we wrap up, let's, let's hear about this exciting uh, expedition you have planned for the spring that is popping up all over Facebook, all over the news. Phil yeah. is like the new spokesperson for this uh, endeavor. Um, let us know what it is and kind of how it got started and, and where it is now. It's, you know, it started like we, we've talked about. It. it really started way back then. And when I realized that, you know, I could be a, a role model and mentor to people, who, to, to people of color who want to get outside, you know. Right. And, um, you know, through the years, you know, traveling, blah, blah, blah. So, you know, I was on Everest 2012. Um, and then I went to Chile. I'm back here, out, being out of the country those three years, there's a lot of programs, a lot of affinity, you know, programs and groups that have come up. You have, you know, you have Brown Girls Climb, you have mm. Color the Crags, you have Latino Outdoors, you have Outdoor Afro, you have it's a lot of affinity groups that are, you know, people want to get outside. It's very, very different than it was back in the 90s and early right. 2000 and so on. And so when I came back from Chile, um, you know, I had been working with and and, and volunteering with Conrad Anchor and, and the, oh, yeah? the Kumbu Climbing Center in Nepal for a number of years. And so Conrad had been climbing with a couple of other young, you know, black climbers. 
And when I came back and kind of got reestablished in the, in the outdoor community, we all met, you know, mm. and the idea was like, Hey, you guys should think about going to Everest. And the idea was born. You wow. know? And so myself, uh, Fred Campbell, Manoa, Anu and, um, and, and Damon Mullins, we all got together. And that was in 2019, actually, when we started the process of, of oh, wow. wanting to make this happen for 2020. Right. Um, and then, you know, I had, you know, in Expedition Denali had happened, right. right? Went in 2013. And so was I- Was that long ago, hey, 2013? Yeah, it was 2013. And so Expedition Denali, ago. that was the first group of African-Americans to summit Denali? Is that- To, to go to Denali. Yeah, okay. they didn't summit Denali. But, right. Um, but Rosemary Saul and KG were on that trip. Okay. Mm-hmm. Were you and on that? So I wasn't on that trip, okay. no. And so when I was when I was putting this team together, I really wanted it to be gender neutral. I mm-hmm. wanted to have as many females in the team as I had males, but finding black women with mountaineering skills and experience is very hard. Yeah. But I knew Rosemary and I knew Adina. And they had continued to, you know, Rosemary's been in a fellowship with Knowles. She's working for Knowles. She's working mountaineering courses now for Knowles and so on. Mm. And when I, uh, when I was in Chile, Rosemary was in the fellowship program. She had come to Chile. So we spent time together in Chile as well. Cool. And in 2018, I ran another uh, expedition to Kilimanjaro, which was the first all Black American expedition oh. to go to Kilimanjaro. And I needed, a, I wanted a female guide to help with that trip. And so Rosemary came on that trip as well. And so I know she had been on Denali. She summited Kilimanjaro. She's strong. You know, she's an, she's an educator, these things. And so spoke to Rosemary, you want to go to Everest? She's like, yeah, I'm in. Okay. And then of course there was KG. And like, if KG is the, probably the closest that I have to a mentor, a black mentor mm. in the outdoors is anyone. And we've, right. we worked together a little bit in, while I was in Kenya and we spent time together in Chile sure. while, while, while I was there and he'd come down and work and so on. I was on another expedition at the same time as Expedition Denali on Denali okay. in 2013. So we spent time together there as well. And then I went through KG to run the trip in, in Kilimanjaro in 2018. Oh, okay. So we're we're really good friends, you know, yeah. it's like family. But I also just looking at his experience, his longevity and what he does, he does very much the same things that I try to do here is yeah. getting young people in Kenya exposed to the outdoors and you know on the mountains and stuff like that. So really I look at that and I say, you know, if anybody, if I can make this happen, I can't I can't do it without trying to get KG on that trip. Right. You know. Yeah. Um, and then some other folks kind of come to the team. And so yeah. it started as, uh, you know, just a group of, you know, experienced Black people who a, a really good next step for them is to go to Everest, you know. Um, and then the other things kind of come second to that, right? When we start talking about representation and the lack of representation mm. um, of people of color, especially at that high level of, of you know, high altitude mountaineering. Yeah, absolutely. And so really, if you look at statistics, and this is something that we found while putting this expedition together, right? And it was put on hold, you know, when the pandemic hit um, and we didn't do much for the, almost the whole of 2020. And we started back up again in October, which was right about the time, uh, you know, what I mean, just after Judge Floyd was murdered, Breonna Taylor, mm-hmm. these people. So a lot of there was a lot of things going on in terms of race relations and social injustice and so on at that time. So we got back together in, uh, in you know, late 2020 and said, hey, we can get back on this. Let's let's go. With those things kind of hanging in the in the in the wings right right um but that's not the reason why we did it you know we were it was just an obvious next step to go to 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 go and i was you know having been there and having been to nepal a number of times it was like yeah that would this is a great opportunity for me as an outdoor leader um and for other folks as climbers and mountaineers and so on and so we just you know 
started going down that path and making it happen. Wow. And uh, your, your other your other trips to Nepal, were they more ever space camp kind of support type jobs or were they trekking or what, what were your other trips? No, these were actually working with um, the Kuma Climbing Center. What we do is we. OK, that's use, when you went with Conrad. Yeah. Oh, OK, yeah. so all of those trips up until 2012 yeah. um, had been working in the climbing school. Yeah. OK, gotcha. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so you had, have you been to base camp or was that or most of those um, kind of climbing trips kind of in the Kumbu Valley on, on one of the side valleys or. Oh, no, they're just in the Kumbu Valley. Yeah. Right. OK. But I was but I was also on Everest in 2012. So. OK. Um, so i had been there. You know, I have experience going there. And so I know the logistics. I know the people, our outfitters, our our support teams. You know, we pull 20 people. I'm I'm going to know probably all of them. Oh yeah, know, because wow. most of them, a lot of them, come from a small village called Fortse in the Kumbu Valley. Right. So, yeah, um, and so yeah, it just it's, it's just kind of picked up speed, and, yeah. and and we kind of went for it, you know. Wow, and, uh, it's it's a lot of work. Um, yeah. We're still putting in work even now, uh, yeah. but you know, to be honest about it, I mean, you look at it. We have three Knowles, you know, Knowles instructors or past Knowles instructors, you know, on that trip, people with Knowles experience. Um, we have a really strong team. Yeah. He yeah. and I are the, are the kind of elder statesmen of that trip. Right. And, uh, and everybody else is like under 40. Right on. Yeah. Wow. And how old are you now? I'm, how old am I? I'm, 50, I'm 58 now. You're 58? I'm wow. 58. I had yeah. no idea. That old. Wow. Yeah. That's amazing. And so, and so who uh, is, are, are you working with Conrad on, on this expedition or do you have some other kind of climbing Sherpas planned or lined up or some other guiding companies? Kind of what are the yeah, brief yeah, we synopsis have a, yeah, and the we, logistics? Yeah, we work with a guiding company, working yeah. with a guiding company there. Um, we'll, you know, just the, the normal route on the South side, the South call route. Yeah. Um, Conrad is kind of a, a, he's a support person, mm-hmm. you know, he's, kind of behind us, kind of behind the scenes, just helping with some logistics and just kind of a, a kind of a think tank in a sense. Sure. Yeah. But as, um, but for the most part, it's us, you know, yeah. That's um, awesome. um, and being the leader of that expedition, it's, it's, you know, we're doing our fundraising and, you know, the world's changed a lot. Yeah. Um, social media is, is huge and you can't get anything done without having a presence on social media, which isn't really my thing. Um, but I'm learning a lot about it as well. And so, yeah, it's it's uh, just over the last week, um, ten days or so, things have really started to pick up with uh, with a, a lot of you know um, news reports and, yeah. and articles and so on. So yeah, that's outstanding. And so, who is do you have a main funder for this? Are you fundraising from everywhere you can, or do you have some main sponsors? How, how's that working? Well, out? yeah, we do. We 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 haven't secured it like we haven't signed it on the dotted line right now. But uh, okay. yeah, we do have a a a main you know, large sponsor that's, that hopefully will, is going to come through huge for us. But, um, right. you know, Everest doesn't, Everest is not cheap. No, you know, no. It's not Can cheap. you give me an idea what kind of a budget you're looking at? 1.2 million. No way. Yeah. Wow. And that's, and that's for, you know, the climb and also documentation of the trip. Right. We're hoping to right. do a, we're hoping to do a, a, a short documentary film on that. It's just that historical, you know, yeah. And, um, you know, so if you if you really look at the if you look at the outdoor industry and then you you've been in it for a while, you yep. you you see it. Right. And anyone who works in the outdoor industry, they see it. Um, but when you put numbers to it, you know, it's either you see it or you don't see it. Right. Yeah. That's the thing. It's like you could put numbers to it. And you go, oh, I could see that. But if you translate numbers to what you see, it's like, oh, I got to go to the bathroom. And you turn around. It's like the number of people of color have just walked past you. You don't really see them. Right. You know, yeah. but if you think of Everest, over 10,000 summits, over 10,000 people have summited Everest. Maybe 10 of them are Black people from around the world. Wow. That's that we know incredible. Of. Yeah. Okay. If you look at the climbing community, just the climbing community, and this is a statistic from the American Alpine Club, Black Americans, African Americans are 1% of the climbing community. Wow. One percent still hey, 1%. Even to this day. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And nine percent is... of the total outdoor community. And that could be anywhere from, you know, having a picnic and, you know, in the park sure. to, you know, climbing Everest. It's, yeah. it's just a huge disparity. It's a lack of representation. And, and there's a we could go into the reasons we'd be here sure. all day long to talk yeah. about yeah. those reasons. Yeah. Um, but that's what really makes this 
Everest expedition different than any other expedition. Yeah. Know? Um, yeah, it's it's going to be so powerful. You know, in, in 2003 or so, I worked, uh, did a short stint in marketing with Knowles, and I did kind of the road show. Where I went to universities and colleges and and high schools all over the U.S. giving presentations to to students to you know hopefully come on some Knowles courses. And I remember, I think it was like it might have been Cincinnati, and I was at a school and did a presentation and. There's some kids acting up and the teacher was trying to get them to pay attention. And, and um, after the fact, one of the kids said to the teacher, the teacher later told me the story and the, the kid said to the teacher, it's like, why, why am I going to pay attention to that? Like that, there's no one like me in any of those pictures or no one like me in any of those videos. Uh, like, why, like, why am I going to go there? Like, can I, can I go back out, you know, and hang out with my friends or whatever? And, and, you know, for me, that was like, it, it really dawned on me then. And, you know, that was kind of the time where Knowles was kind of going through a bit of a diversity shift and focus and refocus. Right. And, um, yes. you know, having images of you guys in, in the Everest region, in the Kumbu region, on the mountain and, and hearing your stories, I can't imagine the, the power that's going to bring to so many kids around the world, not to climb Everest, but to get outdoors and to see right. that, yeah, there's people like me doing this. Right. Yeah. And, and yeah. you know, I, I, obviously hats off to you because this has been your whole life's work is, is showing that there's people doing this right. that, <laughs> and, and it's it you is. doing yeah. it. Right. And it's not, it's not to, it's not my life's work to show them to go climb Everest, just to get right. outside, yeah. you know, yeah. just to get, get outside, nature, be healthy, spend time in nature. You know? And it goes from young to old, you know, because yeah. there are people, I mean, again, I was 21, 22 playing football. Right. Most people after college, what else are they going to do? Yeah. Their, their sports careers are over because you can't play football anymore. Yeah. You know, college, you can't play baseball anymore. So what do people do? They sit around, they get fat, they gain right. weight, they get lazy, they don't exercise because they don't know that there are still things that they can be doing because right. they haven't been exposed to it. Yeah. You yeah. Know? Wow. And so it really has been a long, I've been I can, I can say I've been preaching it, but it's not a preaching. I've just been trying to, to get people to see that. And yeah. it's it's actually quite rewarding to have have had this long career in the outdoor industry and to see where it is right now and to actually still be a part of that change. Right. Yeah. Is is um it's pretty rewarding to be able to and I think about this Everest trip and it's not that I'm like, yeah, I'm 58, I'm not old by any means, but it really is kind of a, a kind of a passing the torch in a sense, you know, I don't know how many more times I'll go to Nepal or sure. you know, to climb and those kind of things, but it's really just, that's what full circle expedition is about is about, you know, you know, giving, giving forward is what I call it. It's not giving mm. back because we want to push it this right. way, you know, yeah, but, I like know, that giving forward and, and using that, you know, my, my longevity, my experience, you know, over that period of time and knowledge and skill and all of those things. Yeah. And then helping other people like me understand that, you know, we don't really, I mean, yeah, we always have choices, right? But there's yeah. so few of us that we right. all have to be role models. We don't really have a choice to not, you know, put our hand out and, and say, hey, let me help you get where you want to go if this is something you want to do. Right. You know, that's yeah. not a lux that's not a luxury I have to do. No, I don't do that. Yeah. 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 If people want to get involved and follow along or, you know, donate some money, is, is there a place yet? Do you have a site up and running that you can send people to? Yeah, we do. Um, yeah. Full Circle Everest. Okay. Is the, is the website www.fullcircleeverest. We'll and in the show notes. Um, if you, we have a GoFundMe page as well, um, the GoFundMe, just go GoFundMe and look up Full Circle Everest and okay. you can make a donation there. Yeah. We can use all we can get and we really, you know, it as well as support, you know, and from a financial standpoint, really what what we really want to see is we want to make sure that this expedition reaches these communities that have right. been underrepresented. So yeah. it's really about making people aware of, of, of this expedition so that they can then tell someone else that may right. not know and then they can tell someone else. And before you know it, it's everybody kind of knows about it. Yeah. I just had a, a guy, a friend of mine who's in Singapore. Um, yesterday text me and said is this is this true <laughs> he was super proud you know because, wow that's you know, amazing yeah and so uh, yeah. No, we appreciate all the support we can get um you know we can you know we'll can, you can continue to follow us all the way through you know to the end of the expedition and it this is really just the beginning 
Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm sure you're going to have a much greater. Yeah. Hopefully yeah, a nice video comes from this nice little documentary and I'm sure you're going to do some speaking and, and uh, you know, visiting a lot of schools and things like that after the fact. And um, yeah. I'm sure, you know, if teachers are out there or people that have communities that would like to have you come speak, I'm sure uh, you'd be, that list is going to grow quickly. And, and so get on that yeah. list because uh, I know you're going to be in hot demand yeah. shortly, yeah. you know, in the, in the weeks and months leading up to it. And, and then especially after, you know, either way, no matter how it goes. Wow. That's, uh, I'm so excited for you. I, you know, I've been over to Nepal and uh, been up in that region and it's just such a special place. And this yeah, is such yeah. a, a monumental trip and uh, yeah, I wish you all the luck with that. Yeah. All right. Well, let's, uh, let's finish off. It's uh, I don't want to take up any more of your time because you've been so gracious this evening. And uh, I just got a last few rapid fire questions. We ask all our guests and, and then we'll uh, we'll call it good. Yeah. All right. Favorite location to lead trips. Ooh, gotta be Kenya. Yeah. 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 Awesome. Any particular reason or just a whole bunch? It, you know, it's just, I mean, Mount Kenya is a beautiful place. It has so many options for climbing and so on, but then the culture and the people, you yeah. know, it's just a fun place, you know, nice. and the coast was, you know, was, that was one of my favorite things to do is be on the East yeah. African coast, you know. Um, so it's not like something I can go and do a trip every day, but. Yeah. or every every year even yep. but uh you that, is your time one, there. that is my favorite places to awesome. trip to that work did you have a favorite piece of gear that you love taking on on expeditions one that went on many or a particular item that you liked on, on one trip or two uh gosh a favorite piece of gear jeez whoa guess it well, no i don't really have a favorite piece of gear all right Mm-mm. wow not a mug, not a hot drink mug, not a no. hat. Mm-mm. Wow. Yeah. No, no, uh, in, not tied to any material. Not, no not material. tied to anything. No. Mm-mm. Right on. You know, you, you know, have... it's funny. My, my, my first, even a lot of my career, I probably, even some of the stuff I have now, all that shit came from the instructor giveaway box. Right. Like, I didn't spend money on gear. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Know? Yeah. That's great. All right. Well, I think you might be our first guest that had, didn't have a favorite piece or at least something to mention. All right. Well, that's uh, more hats to you because you're the repairman and uh, you know, <laughs> you don't hang on to things. You, you hang on to them forever. You just keep repairing them. Awesome. Okay. That's let's good. move along. What is, I've just added this, uh, this new question in um, recently. What's your favorite supplemental food that you would add to rations um, when you're leading expeditions? <laughs> um meat meat Meat. yeah yeah some kind of some kind of meat yeah it's really good you'll you'll get along with kg on uh, on your trips then yeah Yeah. oh yeah but you know but but the flip side of that is the thing that i would that i ate most that i'd never had to worry about not having was grits because people didn't eat grits right in the field like claudia would rest in peace claudia as well too but yeah. um she would always save all the grits that came back from the field and she's like oh phil i have something for you here it is no so, way. oh yeah that's cool I wow. never, I didn't, the whole time i worked for nova i never paid for a, a box of grits ever right on wow that's awesome uh what's the best back backcountry costume that you've had or that you've someone seen someone use in a course costume backcountry costume sure, it's got to be that i can't even think of it i wasn't really a a dresser upper you know what yeah, i mean yeah that's all right yeah um, not everybody is we can come but, back to you uh, you might have to you might just have to say the birthday suit <laughs> right, on. right i mean nothing better than being in the winds in a you know in a nice warm afternoon and be able to just hang out by the lake and go skinny dipping right <laughs> that's right yeah Put some sunscreen on, some mosquito repellent. You're good to go. Yeah. <laughs> nice. All right. So why did you, what did you like most about working in outdoor education? Uh, it's just the places I like being out, you know, and being mm-hmm. on that. The, the biggest thing I think is getting on that cycle of, of, of the sun and moon. Right? Mm-hmm. Just kind of knowing like where, where, what that cycle was of the moon, you know, or using it as a as a time clock, mm-hmm. you know, like when you have a full moon and you're you're bivied outside, and all of a sudden you wake up like someone shine a light in your face, like oh, it must be mm-hmm. such right. and such time, but the moon's in my face, you know. But I think that's one of the things as 
that really connects us to, as as human beings is just that cycle right of the sun and moon yeah yeah and being able to teach in that environment hey mm-hmm. and share it with others that that probably wouldn't get a chance to right all right, last one. If you could go back to any one location and share a hot drink with somebody, where would that location be? Any particular spot? Particular spot that you worked in a course? Uh, yeah, I, it'd probably be somewhere in, in the, in, in somewhere up on Tovity Pass. Oh, yeah? You know, yeah, yeah. You know, go up there in the middle of winter time and Nice. camp out and have a hot drink with someone yeah it's been a lot of time up on totally and yeah working working courses up there as well as, as well as personal so yeah i yep. really miss that place for sure yeah cool wow well phil this has been a real treat i really appreciate you taking so much time to speak with me this evening and uh i look forward yeah. to, to following you yeah Sean, it was fun thanks man for having me and thanks quincy for yeah. suggesting that i come on this thing otherwise i probably wouldn't have done it but, <laughs> yeah yeah it's awesome that's well good awesome. luck with the rest of them man. and uh yeah keep in touch follow us you know www.fullcircleeverest will be gone in in march 2022 that's awesome well i look forward to following along and uh i look forward to, to connecting someday when i get down to colorado hopefully road trip bring the family down to cortez and, and i'll look you up for sure yeah, look me up for sure. Yeah, we have a All place right. for you to stay. Yeah. Fantastic. Awesome. awesome well, I, I won't keep you any longer. You guys have a great night and um, yeah, good luck with the Everest. And, uh, you know, we'll put this, we'll put the links in our show notes and things like that. And um, awesome. keep us posted. Sounds good. Thanks, man. Appreciate right. it. Yeah. Yep. Have a good Ciao. night. Uh-huh.